Good evening. My name is Samuel Mancalvis, and I'm a sophomore at the University of Scranton. My major is a uh, computer science, and I'm also a work study at the Slattery Center. Uh, throughout my two years here, I found that the combination of Ignatian discernment and magis has allowed me to approach my faith from a fresh yet rich angle. Now, before we begin, we would like to give special thanks to the Jesuit Center and our very own Bob Dylan, Father Pat Rogers, for support of this event. Tonight, we have the great pleasure of hosting Father Kevin O'Brien, author of the book, The Ignatian Adventure, a keenly insightful guide to the spiritual exercises of St. Ignatius. Father O'Brien is president at Santa Clara, Santa Clara University and among Jesuits is perhaps best known as a great cook. Our two moder moderators are well known to us. Dean Deb Pellegrino runs the Ponusca College of Professional Studies, a school with Ignatian spirituality coursing through its veins. Dean Pellegrino has done the spiritual exercises and considers them the foundation of Ignatian education. And Rose Sebastianelli, an esteemed and popular professor of statistics at the Kenya School of Management, is constantly striving to blend the Ignatian spirituality and vision into the business school curriculum and uses the same magis power to make her one of the best long distance cyclists in the region, a regular victor in races with the Jesuit Center's own Ryan Sheehan. This event is part of a Slattery Center series called the Humanities in Action. Saint, Saint Ignatius's work is one of the greatest creations of the humanities. The humanities course through Ignatian pedagogy. And tonight we get a firsthand look at the Ignatian humanities through the active life and thought of Father O'Brien. And now our moderators, our moderators and esteemed guests, we turn it to you. Thank you. Well, thank you, Sam. Uh, we're off to a great start. Welcome everyone. And Father Kevin O'Brien, our first question of the evening. What to start are the spiritual exercises and can you trace them as a theological and cultural force through the 500 years of their existence? That's the way to start. Oh I thought it would be a little bit an easier one. Like, what did you have for lunch today? Um, <laughs> no. <laughs> well, I want to first uh, say uh, thanks for your welcome, Deb, and our, our good folks at, uh, at, at Scranton University. Uh, I am in a Maryland province, or formerly a Maryland province Jesuit, uh, sort of a, came of age as a Jesuit on the East Coast uh, before coming out here to California, where I serve as president of Santa Clara. But I've been to Scranton a number of times, a great fan of the school and all the good work that you do there in Northern Pennsylvania. Uh, shout out to Pat Rogers, my good friend, uh, well known to all of you. Um, he's actually, I met him before I joined the Jesuits. He was one of the reasons why I ended up joining. If I, can be, if I could be as cool as Pat Rogers, then maybe I could become a Jesuit. Um, and uh, I, I, my thanks to uh, uh, Jim and Betsy Slattery. Um, uh, the Slattery Center does great work. Jim and Betsy have uh, sons who went or are at Santa Clara, and we're very, very grateful for their affiliation with uh, with us at Santa Clara. But I know uh, I know his heart lies in Scranton. Um, and finally, uh, just it's a great day for Scranton, not because I'm here, but because you have Joe Marina as your next president. Uh, Joe's I've known since he joined the society. He is a, a good man, a great educator, and I look forward to being with him as a president as I have with Scott Pilar's over these, over these years. Uh, Santa Clara or uh, Scranton has been blessed with really great leadership. So uh, Scott, and uh, if you're on this, um, and uh, to Joe, congratulations. Um, okay, where do you begin? What are the spiritual exercises? So, I mean, uh, yeah, so, the spiritual exercises in the end are both, uh, you know, a, a book and, and a way of life. Um, Ignatius crafted the spiritual exercises, it, literally a set of exercises for the soul based on his own conversion experience back in the, the early 1500s. And he gave these exercises of the soul to other people. And eventually they were so helpful to people, he wrote them down and compiled them into a book which was finally published in, in, uh, in some Latin in uh, around uh, 1548, right? So soon before he died. So, you know, it's been a book for a long time. And, and the, the idea of the exercises is you give this book to spiritual directors who then lead other people through the exercises. And that's where it's the second part of the exercises are a way of life. It's, they're, they're, they're meant to be lived. It's not like, um, um, you know, an exercise regime that you go through just to get through your morning exercises, as I, as I often do. It's actually a, a way of life that uh, you are to bring to all parts of your life uh, throughout the day. 
And there are so many different ways of making the spiritual exercises in different forms, uh, in short forms and long forms. Um, uh, and, and so I guess just to emphasize that part of the genius of the exercises and the reason why they've been around for nearly 500 years is embedded in these spiritual exercises, which are, um, uh, which are varied in form, um, but embedded in them is adaptability and flexibility. It, and that's why I think they've lasted this long is that the, while there is a plan or a program in the spiritual exercises, Ignatius always conditioned that plan or program on the person that's before you, on each person, because as he wrote at the beginning of the exercises that God works with each person individually, personally and directly. And if that's the case, we have to be flexible in approach because God is laboring so differently in all of us. So I think that's one of the reasons why it's lasted 500 years is that they're flexible, they're adaptable to so many different contexts and people and times. And I know we'll probably delve more deeply into that notion of adaptability later, but I, I you know, instead of tracing, there's lots of theological and spiritual themes that cross the ages, but I guess I want to emphasize the, the sort of the method here and its flexibility and adaptation. And that is why they've worked for so many people for so long. Well, thank you so much. We'll be back to your adaptability and flexibility in a little bit. Um, so maybe that actually answers the next question, but maybe can you talk a little bit more about why the exercises still feel so current and so modern? Yeah. So, you know, the language can change. So um, certainly if you read the original text written in Spanish and later translated in Latin, it would sound very, you know, 16th century, right? The images, a lot of feudal and medieval images. Um, the language would be probably more resonant with the times. And so over the centuries, you know, translators have adapted some of the language to make it more accessible. And so I've done that in, uh, in my book and other translators have done that as well, where, you know, some of the medieval imagery and notions just won't make sense today. And of course, Ignatius would be happy with that because, you know, uh, the exercises have to be meaningful and intelligible to people in order for them to be useful. Um, and so I, I think that, uh, the, the language can be contemporized in a way that's accessible to people while being faithful to what the exercises are. And if you say, well, what's the point of making the exercises? Like, why would someone do it? I mean, and there's no one path to God and there's, there's different religions offer different ways to God. In the Catholic tradition, in the Christian tradition, we have many different spiritualities. And the Ignatian approach is just one of them. It's not better or worse. A Franciscan approach may be better to people, for some people than this one, a more contemplative meditative approach. But for a lot of people, the Ignatian approach has been helpful. Why? Because I think it's so practical as Ignatius was. So what's the point of the exercises? Well, he says at the beginning that the, in a sense, the, the point of the exercises is to free the person from all the stuff that gets in the way of their loving and serving God and other people. So very practical. Right. The, the point of the exercises is, is to liberate, to free the person from everything that's getting in the way of their ability to love and serve God and other people. And this notion of service is so vital because the exercises are to be put into practice, just like Jesuit education. Jesuit education, we don't believe in knowledge for knowledge's sake, although there's a certain glory in that. Approaching truth and beauty. That's, there's, a, there's a value in that. And we do that in the humanities, of course, at a Jesuit university in the arts. But it's also about goodness. It's also about putting into practice what we are learning and praying through at a Jesuit university or in the exercises so that we can better serve God and other people, so that we can better love other people. And so, you know, we can talk more about this um, if you wish, but this, this notion of, well, you know, the pathway to that service is freedom. And that, that to me is one of the reasons why to go back to Deb's question, or actually Rose, your question too, about 
you know, why does it speak to people today? Because it's speaking about freedom, not in the way of license, like let's do whatever I want. That's not freedom. That actually could be a bondage at some point where the person is captive to things beyond their control. It's not license, I'll do whatever I want. It's freedom, it's an interior freedom. It's a freedom of the spirit. It's a freedom of the heart. It's a freedom of the soul. To be free of all that baggage we carry around inside that gets in the way of our responding with passion, with excitement, with hope, that gets in the way of our loving as we, as God created us to love. So we may have to overcome fears or images of ourself that are binding us. There's freedom that Ignatius invites us to, that God invites us to. And so really throughout the exercises, there's over and over again, the point of the exercises is leading us to greater freedom so that we can be free of all the stuff that gets in the way of our loving and serving. That is becoming the person God calls us to be. Thank you. You know, Father Kevin, when you're talking about your book and you just taught, you just really summarized it a lot, you know, to be practical and you think about the Ignatian adventure. Was it that sense of interior freedom that inspired you to write the book? And what process, you know, I saw you with your pen and that's how when I went through your book, I was jotting notes and thinking of my own children and, and just my own experience. So if you could talk a little bit about the process of writing this book would be very interesting. And then as you went through the book and you were being adaptable, how did it change your vision of the exercises of being a Jesuit? And right. you think about St. Ignatius, you know, he was an incredible talent and uh, Greg Jordan would like to say the leading figure in the humanities. Do you buy into all that? And is that what you, you really, why you wrote the book? Right. Yeah, um, I, I wrote the book in the end because I wanted to help people. What Ignatius, if, there, there, if one of the most common phrases in all of Ignatius's writings, and there are, we have a lot, thousands and thousands of his letters. One of the most common phrases is to help souls, which simply means to help people. And so I wrote the book in order to help people. That's why he wrote the exercises. And, and I really, I found the exercises spoke to me as a Jesuit, and I wanted to share them, translate them in a way that was accessible to people today. Um, there are lots of other great guides and, and all were helpful to me, but I found that I had a certain approach to them based on my own life experience that I wanted to, to, sh to share with other people and sort of write it in my own language. What I really like about the exercises and, I, and was really helpful to me in the book is you know, if you think about it, Ignatius wrote the spiritual exercises based on his own sort of long conversion experience. You know, everyone knows the story, Ignatius, the cannonball, mm -hmm. you know, knocks him out, puts him in bed for six months, decides to change his life, goes on the road for several years trying to figure out his life. And, you know, when I was, you know, before becoming a Jesuit, I, I went to college and I went to law school and I was practicing law and you know, I was um, trying to figure out my life in my 20s as much as, frankly, Ignatius was trying to figure out his life in, the, in his 20s. I wanted to, I know I wanted to serve. That's why I went to law school. I, I was hopefully getting involved in politics. But, uh, but a lot of the reasons I wanted it was really a lot of ego and unhealthy ambition. So uh, I, I knew I needed something different. That, that call to serve was deep in me but there was also a lot of the ego. And so I, I stepped away from my law practice and started to teach high school. Uh, that opportunity was given to me sort of out of the blue by a former teacher, but just at the right time where I needed to step away and say what, not simply was, what did I want to do with my life, which is what, how I would normally put it. I changed the question and said, well, God, what would you want me to do with my life? And frankly, I was afraid to ask that question because I had this under sort of this image of God, and I speak a lot about the images of God that we carry in our heads. I had this image of God as sort of, God is sort of stern and mean and was going to ask me to do stuff I don't want to do. So I never wanted to ask God, so what do you want me to do? And it was interesting, part of the freedom that I experienced in my 20s with the help of Ignatian spirituality was looking at God in a different way. And Ignatius's image of God, and his conversion was that of a school teacher working with a pupil. That's a beautiful image. Mm -hmm. 
I sort of changed my image of God a bit. I suppose of the sort of distant taskmaster, sort of the, 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 the you know, a, a coach who wanted my good, but was asking me to go through this really difficult obstacle course all the time. And there was no letting up and it was all work and all work and all work and hardship. And, you know, it's like jumping through hoops to get to God. And I, my image of God changed where it was like, no, 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 God actually wants my joy. God became, you know, more of a friend through the person of Jesus. And, and uh, uh, that really changed everything for me. I, I, I was, when I learned, and this is a central Ignatian insight that I was gifted with in, in, through Ignatian spirituality was that our deepest desires are God's desires for us. So what we most want deep down is what God wants for us. So there's no competition. When God asks us to do something, it's actually what we really want to do. But all that baggage and all that stuff that we carry on, all that stuff we need to be free of, that prevents us from getting in touch with our deep desires. And for so long, the Christian tradition had run away from desires for fear of, you know, these are unhealthy passions and they lead us to all these terrible things. And of course, we have to be careful with our desires and passions. But Ignatius said, well, those desires and passions can actually be God-given and good. And then when I, and that was it, what Ignatius, Ignatius basically had God was honing his desires and passions and, and directing them not to a, a life at court, but a life serving, serving God as sort of this itinerant preacher. I, I, my desires were honed and changed from serving as a lawyer and politician to eventually serving as a teacher and then as a Jesuit over some time. And so there was great freedom there. And so what I learned is in writing the book, looking at Ignatius's life, Ignatius tells the story of God by telling the story of his own life. Right? You, you of course can, ex you, you, can, you can read the story of God in the scriptures, the God experienced in Jesus Christ, the God that the, the Jewish people experienced, the God that, that the early Christian community experienced. But Ignatius said, well, whoa, God's active in my life. And he, and he wrote a, his own autobiography to, to, to attest to that. And then wrote the exercises, or before he wrote the exercises, and later wrote his autobiography. But you know, he said, "No, God is active in my life." And so, what I do in the book is sort of trace together my life as a testimony to how I learned to find God active and laboring for good, my good and God's good and the good of the world. And and that is a sort of a liberating perspective because my story is God's own story and we're not in competition we're not writing in different ways we're we're in sync and we're creating something beautiful together ah, that's wonderful thank you so now we understand a little bit more about the exercises and also a little bit about your life in particular your conversion uh, from an up-and-coming lawyer to a poverty embracing Jesuit priest, dare I say. <laughs> but now I you're- could probably be better on the poverty like most Jesuits, so. Uh... <laughs> but now you're a university president. And so um, as a faculty member in the business school, I'm particularly interested in how you can, um, well, how the spiritual exercises help you lead. Uh, and mm. in particular, what areas of management would they impact the most? And then I, I guess I would ask, a third question, uh, what would be the kind of advice that you would give to uh, leaders in other areas in, you know, in the private sector, in government, uh, who are looking maybe toward the, uh, the spiritual exercises to help them reimagine their role as a leader? Yeah, I've actually, uh, yeah, I, this is one of my favorite topics is, is Ignatian leadership. Um, you know, what does it mean? And certainly those on this call are Ignatian leaders in different ways, whether it's Sam or a student leader or, or or other leaders on this call and the staff or faculty. So what does it mean? And so um, again, Ignatian spirituality is very flexible and adaptable, right? So it's just not for the overly pious. I'm actually not a very pious person. I'm, I'm spiritual and devout in my own way, but I'm not overly pious. It's just not for pious people or for, or uh, the exercises are not just for people who have it all figured out. I don't. Um, they're adaptable and flexible enough to be with someone on their entire life journey which is great, right? Pope Francis speaks about a God of surprises and says early on in an interview in America Magazine, if, if a person says they have God all figured out, they don't know God. And so I find that Ignatian spirituality over one's life evolves, um, or I'm sorry, our understanding of the exercises evolves, which is why they're so, so rich 
and a resource to so many. I think for me, as, as I grew in leadership, um, you know, at uh, I was at Georgetown for a number of years with Pat Rogers before he went to he went to Scranton. I went out out west to Santa Clara, and then in my role now, I was a dean here, and then as university president. I think one of the greatest gifts. Well, let me let me let me name two, which have been helpful. One is that sense of freedom. Um, that is, we want to make sure when you're leading that your stuff. The baggage we carry around is not getting in the way of the common good, of the good of the of the of the mission, right? And so when we, you know, and that's something that we we can do with this, you know, in our own prayer with the spiritual director, with the therapist, we have to be very, you know, self-reflective enough to know, okay, this is going for good, this is getting in the way. This is where my ego is getting in the way of the good of the mission. This is where my unfreedoms are getting in the way, my fears, for instance, or my unhealthy self-involvement, that's, that's getting in the way, right? And so there is a part of the exercises where one encounters one's sin. And that's, that's a painful lift sometimes, but uh, it's actually healthy because the point of looking at sin in the spiritual exercises is not to make you feel bad about yourself. It's actually to help you experience the liberating, loving mercy of God. And to say, hey, we're not, no one's perfect. God didn't make us perfect. And when we have the courage, the gentleness to be self-reflective enough, we realize, okay, you know, this is a part of me that I have to be careful about. It's an unfreedom. God wants to liberate me from that. That type of examination sort of takes place, you know, hopefully throughout one's life um, to say, okay, this is where I need to be careful. And so there is a sense. So the first gift in terms of leadership is the, the, the exercises give you the tools of reflection. The exercises gives you permission to be reflective as a leader um, so that we can better serve the common good or the mission of the university or department or unit, whatever group you're a part of. The second gift is discernment. So discernment. Um, the Jesuits did a, 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 a lot of strategic planning a few years ago, and they developed something called the University Apostol Universal Apostolic Preferences of the Society of Jesus, which includes lay people as well. And the first priority of uh, the first, what we call the, the Apostolic Preferences of the Jesuits, the first priority or preference was sharing the spiritual exercises at a way, as a way to God including the gift of discernment. So this is why the book is so important. This is why this conversation is so important because the, the exercises are a gift, I think, to our world today, not just Catholics, not just Christians, to all people, or to people who are seeking or struggling, but particularly the gift of discernment. And I think that's, as a leader, as a university, both Santa Clara and Scranton, I think that's a real opportunity for us. And I don't think we do it well enough at Santa Clara. I don't think it's, it's not part of my practice as a leader enough. Um, I think I'm inviting the university uh, with colleagues to sort of understand discernment better, to think about how one could make it a practice at a university, um, not just in one's personal life, which one needs to do if one is to lead that way, but also how do we make a university more discerning? Um, and what is discernment? It, you know, discernment is, is uh, decision-making which, in which God is part of the conversation. It's, it's just not, I'll often people just say discernment when they actually mean decide. And discernment is much more than that. It, it's, it, it is an a, a, a intentional awareness of the signs of the times about what's happening in the world outside of ourselves. That is, it's a, it's a rigorous attention to our experience as well as attentiveness to what's happening inside of ourselves, the pushes and pulls, the, the, the movements of the spirit as Ignatius calls them inside of ourselves. So being attentive to both our outward and inside experience, to be reflective about it individually and then together, to make a, a decision based on that, and then finally to act. Um, and that that's part of another conversation another time, but. Discernment, I think, is is a real gift to a leader and to a, a university. 
my mind is spinning. I just want to thank you so much. So, you know, I think back, you know, I was going to ask you your experience with the first time you went through the exercise. And as you're talking about discernment, I think that I feel so blessed. I, I don't know many universities where I can actually say my assistant dean, Ray Schwank and I, Mm. went through the spiritual exercises together with Father Bagley. And um, I think we have such a bond to this day that even though we're, he's Zooming and he's remote and I'm remote, we don't forget to pray and we can read each other's minds because it's almost like you have that awakening. So it goes right into the next, you know, the discovery of the, f- the first time you've ever went through the exercises. But you think about utility in education and work. And that's here we are. We're blessed to be at a Catholic Jesuit university where we can say, we see God in all things. And how do we work at that to discern? So as you think about the exercises in your everyday life as a college president, as a, as a true leader, and this is where I have to, I have to tell you, and I know there's many people watching this, it's hard, but I have to kick myself because I always think that I can solve the problems. And when I realize I can't solve any problems, I have to turn it over to God. And so foremost, it's spiritual. But then you realize the concept of the majus and the more. How do we use our God-given talents to discern, to fulfill our gifts, and how do we make it happen by using the exercises? Does that make sense? I, yeah. I just want to say thank you to my assistant, Dean, I, and Father Bagley. If it wasn't for them, I don't think I'd be here today. Yeah. Thank you. So could you talk a little about, about education and work and how you make that happen with the exercises? Uh, um, maybe, could you clarify that question a bit? All right. So like, here we are at a university. You've got right. faculty. You have students. You have staff. You know, you talked about discernment, but how do we look at our talents then and use our talents for the greater good? Right. Well, I think that's where um, you invite people into the conversation that's sort of the spirit of reflection for people to to become more aware of the talents they have to offer. Because that's that's part of the unfreedoms that we can carry around or sinfulness or whatever you want to call it, where it's like either people are too hard on themselves, they they don't appreciate their talents or other people are not calling forth that talent. So uh, it's, it's helping us, you know, the exercises in a sense give us some, you know, different lenses to view the world, right? Not just as we see it, but how God sees it. And there's something liberating in that, uh, in that perspective. Um, uh, and so, cause we can be blind and biased in other ways. So how can we um, call out the talents and the goodness of other people and also ourselves so that those can be unleashed for the good uh, of the university, for instance. But I do think that the discernment is key, giving people permission to be reflective and not just reactive. When you actually look at the course of our days, we're reacting all the time and the, there's a press for time and there's all these pressures. And But to actually, and sometimes we, we, we have to make a decision for whatever reason in a very, very rapid way. But often we just, we have to give permission to be a little bit more reflective, to give that space to really think about, well, how is this whatever sitting with me inside? What's what's happening to inside myself? And then to share that with other people who are reflecting in the same way where together there could be a new way proposed because we're, we're, um, we're sharing on a deeper, call it more spiritual level. Um, and we're also can name our talents and also our limits. It's part of that freedom, the freedom that comes with rigorous honesty. I mean, and again, the whole point here, you know, a sign of freedom, a sign that we are discerning well, a sign that we are, in a sense, living the exercises is that we're living with authenticity. And what does it mean to be authentic? It simply means that when what we do flows from the deepest sense of who we are, right? Authenticity simply means that what we do, you know, what we decide and act upon, what we do flows from the deepest sense of who we are, if you want to say whose we are, mm-hmm. um, given our, we're embedded in relationships with God and other people, so that our action flows from the deepest sense of who we are. That's what we want. And we all know those times where we make choices and they're 
not good choices. And at the end of it, we go, oh, that's not me. And that's exactly the point. It's not you, you know, because you're acting out of unfreedom. You know, it, it, it was not you. That's the point. We also know there's times where we make a decision, a choice, and we act on it. But we say, wow, yes, I feel free. I feel I'm living authentically. I'm living with integrity. There's a deep peace. I mean, that's a sign of a good discernment. And so we can experience that personally. But what I'm arguing for is that a university can, has to live authentically to its mission. And universities can get off track too when not discerned well, right? Right. So we make big decisions as a university and it could be about, you know, who we, who we choose for leadership or, or, or what our strategic priorities are. Those are all matters of discernment. So if Scranton is doing strategic planning or some form of strategic visioning, call it discernment. That's much better. It's a much better approach. Um, it's a SWOT analysis with more, even more depth. No, I like that. I like that. I'm going to use that. Thank you. <laughs> now we're going to focus on our work. So Rose has a question on business education. Well, before I got to that question, though, because as you're discussing uh, a university, I'm actually thinking of other organizations as well, companies, mm -hmm. for example, you yeah. know, and I think about leaders and I think about the culture of organizations. And, you know, we talk about the forces of good and evil. And of course, the spiritual exercises are a personal journey. But I look at evil and good playing out at the organizational level as well. And I'm wondering, yep. you know, we talk about adaptability of the exercises and I'm wondering, are there components of the exercises that leaders might use to help change their culture uh, mm. and make organizations better or good, more socially responsible, more environmentally yeah. uh, responsible? Yes, no, I think different parts of the exercises can lead to a really healthy self-examination of who we are. Um, and of course, you know, for the, for Christians, you know, looking at the choices Jesus makes and then how Catholic social teaching is the sense of reflection on the gospels, right? And so there's, you know, there, the, a bulk of the exercises walk is walking with Jesus through the gospels from birth to his death and resurrection. And, you know, why do we do that? There's a fundamental grace in the spiritual exercises. We pray that we want to come to know Jesus more intimately so that we can follow him more closely and therefore serve him more faithfully, you know, to know and to love and to serve. And in a sense, you know, as we come to get to know that, that the person of Jesus Christ, we, we come to hopefully take on the values of Jesus, which hopefully should be incarnated in the choices that an organization makes. And of course, Catholic social thought can really help us really think about that very, very practically. And of course, discernment obviously is very, very helpful there. Um, to see the different movements that we're called to, um, you know, to, the movements to avoid, uh, the movements to follow. And again, I think that's the spirit of God works through people. And if that's the case, people who live in organizations to call us to, to greater authenticity as a, as a Catholic and Jesuit university, for instance. So, um, and there's all sorts of choices that we have to make all the time. Um, yeah, so I think that's a, that's a great question. I think so it's a, certainly it's about ethics and certainly it's about uh, values um, and it's about the choices we make to live authentically. I, let me just say, because I've spoken a few times about ad, ad, adaptation and you know, certainly the exercises come out of a Christian context and, um, and they're often used in Christian contexts and Catholic contexts and they're steeped in the Jewish and, and Christian tradition, uh, certainly. But the exercises as I view them are, are eminently adaptable to people of other faiths and other traditions or even no tradition. Um, and of course you have to adapt the exercises because they're really coming from a Christian context. But I think we can adapt them faithfully where I've given the exercises to, to, or offered the exercises in different forms to students and faculty and staff who don't identify as Christian. Um, had a powerful experience with uh, a, a Jewish person who went through the exercises. Um, one who was sort of an agnostic or sort of a humanist who, for whom the person of Jesus was very compelling and through whom discernment and freedom really spoke to him. Um, I worked with, uh, there's a wonderful book by Aaron Klein at Georgetown. 
in which after making the exercises, she decided to apply the exercises to her field in theology, which was um, uh, Eastern religion. So Buddhism and Hinduism, for instance. And she was thinking about, wow, what are the adaptations we could make? These are fascinating just as a, so we have scholars of the exercises doing those adaptations. We have practitioners doing them. But I think for most, for young people today, let's think of our students for a second. I, I just think that on campus, you know, many of my identify as Catholic and Christian, but I imagine a lot don't, or they're seeking a home or they're, they don't know where they belong. The exercises are for them too, um, with a gifted spiritual director and a, and a gentle one, I think the exercise is gonna be very, very helpful for them as well. I'm glad you touched on that because our students, um, they're unbelievable, you know, and they're really committed to community-based learning um, and, and working with the marginalized. You know, I think about even in uh, the Panuska College of Professional Studies, you know, we have the Leahy Community Health and Family Center. And right. it's a place where our students can practice and then soon they graduate, either they go on to our graduate programs or they move on to become practitioners in the helping professions, we call it. So nursing, counseling, physical therapy, occupational therapy, teaching, um, kinesiology. It's very, we're very people-driven, client-driven, and it starts even as you're a student. How do the spiritual exercises, I keep thinking about what heroes we have with this pandemic. And I think about our nurses, you know, and even now our student nurses are volunteering to give uh, vaccines. Then we can't get those vaccines out soon enough. But how would, you know, think about what everyone's been through. Not only our students, I keep feeling so sorry for, you know, our undergrads in college, because it wasn't like this when I went to college, you know, at St. Louis University, part of it being in the dorm was fun and you could, you enjoyed each other. Now you have these masks on and, you just, you feel so, um, it's hard. It's hard, clinical mental health is very hard right now. How do the spiritual exercises help the professional, the practitioner, our students, our faculty, our staff, how can we apply that in our field? You know, you mentioned theology, but you know, now let's take it to, you know, out into the world, down the street. Right, so I think that's, I think each person you know, discerns how they can best do that. You know, the right. Ignatius' belief is that God was laboring, you know, in the person and in the world. And so if that's the case, then there, there are countless ways that the exercises can be lived out as the person tries to make choices about how they would live their lives authentically. And so, um, you know, I made a decision realizing that, you know, as a lawyer, and I don't think it was, I didn't, I didn't really know what discernment was. I've gotten better at as a Jesuit, but certainly I, I figured out, I discerned that living for me, Kevin, as a lawyer, and being a lawyer is a great noble profession, but I realized, wow, this is not where I'm, I'm living with my deepest joy and a lot of talent. I, I was a good lawyer, but it was like, it, I, this, there's, there's greater service I can offer, not better, just greater and different service that was more in keeping with who I was. And so then, you know, that led to a teaching, which led to the Jesuits, which led to being involved in education and leadership and lots of other things, including um, serving on the, the serving with migrants and refugees with the Jesuit refugee service in mm -hmm. Arizona, Mexico border and a detention center and a refugee camp. And again, in all those contexts is whether it was a teaching in a classroom, whether it was in a, a, a detention center, whether it's in a, you know, an administrative office, whether it's saying mass as a priest, whether it's being a brother and to within my family, to a, to my brother and sister, um, you know, I the exercises help me live out each of those vocations in my life, and again, making choices that that really live out that way. So, if, if you're a nurse, nurse practitioner, it's first of all to God for God to affirm the goodness of those gifts that you have, to help you realize the joy that can come with living out of that vocation. And hopefully to soothe you, to inspire you, to heal you when you need it. And, and the sense is that, you know, hopefully whether we're a lawyer or a nurse or a teacher or, or a doctor or, um, or, or anything that you are at the university, that with the exercises, again, you're, the whole point, again, remember, is to, you're trying to draw closer to God, uh, trying to know your God more intimately mm -hmm. so you can follow, you, so you can love more. And 
one of the gifts of the exercise is you come to know your God in a different way. As I explained earlier in my life, my images of God changed and you feel God with you. For me recently, the uh, given this very challenging year as a university president, with all the different pandemics we're dealing with, with racism, with the virus and all of its impacts. Mm -hmm. and, you know, the image that has come up to me a lot of my own prayer and using some of the tools of the exercises about being in the boat with Jesus. Jesus is actually, if you read the gospels, Jesus is in a boat a lot. And for whatever reason, I'm drawn to being with Jesus in the boat, Jesus on the sea, the, ra the waves are rocking. But yet there's something for me that's extremely grounding when in the midst of all the challenges of this year and the good days and bad days I have in my current role of service, I have this abiding sense of Jesus's presence and faithfulness to me, that God's with me in this, that I'm not, I'm not alone. And that's been so, it's so basic. You're like, oh, why didn't you realize that? Well, I guess I did, but I felt it in a very, very deep, deep, deep way. Um, and, but it multiplies, right? That gift that you experience, it just doesn't make us feel good. We get to offer that to other people. We get to witness to other people, to your patients or to your students. You know, I, I, it's, it's obviously pretty public by now, but a few we, weeks ago, I, I offered mass for President Biden and his family on the morning of the inauguration. Uh, the Bidens are friends of mine from uh, for many years when I was in Washington, and they, ju they just simply asked, as the second Catholic vice president, um, it, they asked if we could have mass in the morning. And so we did, as Kennedy did on his inauguration day. And the, the, wor the word that I offered them, and you know, the homily is, is online and very public now, but the word I offered him in my homily that morning, which was very brief, was coming out of my own experience of, of leading in turbulent times, no, no way the same than being a president, was to be simply that God, that the Lord is with you, so you don't have to be afraid, you know? That God is with you and stands with you and is helping you and encouraging you. And that was a simple truth that I offered to another human being, albeit the soon to be inaugurated president, but it was, it was a, it was a, it was a word that I wanted to offer everyone there that morning and a word that sits deeply within me and that I would want to offer tonight to all of you good people here. It's like I, in the spiritual exercises and the in, in, in Ignatian spirituality, the, the gift that I've been giving and living out the, the, this spirituality in the last year for me was an abiding sense of God's faithful presence in this turbulent sea that God is with me and I, I don't, we don't have to be afraid. Oh, that's beautiful. And we can find more information on our Jesuit webpage and our Jesuit center on campus too. Great. So just in case people were asking. Thanks. Um, I, I just wanted to ask a question. When I read your book, one of the things that really um, struck me was advice that was given regarding crafting parables with modern day counterparts because imagination is such a big part of this. Right. And um, as I read that, I, I thought particularly about our students and I thought how, um, well, I'd like to hear your views on how that could actually enhance their creativity as yeah. well as their spirituality and maybe impart some of the counter culture aspects of the gospel Oh yeah, them, right. 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 Well, when you look at the parables, um, and we can pray with them in so many different ways, and we hear them when we go to church. Um, you know, parables are, are stories that have, usually have a that have a twist that gets people's attention, and often we miss the point because we don't understand the historical context. The twist can be jarring, it can be funny, and often we we don't get it because we're not you know living two thousand years ago in Palestine. Um. But the parables actually, you know, speak to us today in different ways. But we can also write, we can translate those parables into our own, you know, language and the context. So, you know, there, there's a lot of parables of sheep and shepherds. Like, I, I don't know a sheep or shepherd <laughs> regularly, but that could be something different. It could be, you know, Oh, I do, unfortunately. <laughs> But we can we can we can draw references to who are the lost in our world today? Who are the you know the lost sheep? Well, it's like well maybe it's this young people who feel alienated in our church. You know I think of um, you know gay and lesbian Catholics who may be you know feeling searching in the church or lost or not respected who are wandering about wanting a home. Right. So this is one example of a of a of a example. I think about migrants and refugees. You know those often now there's lots of references in the in the Jewish scriptures to them. 
but you know, Jesus was a migrant and refugee. Uh, he and his family uh, fleeing to Egypt and then returning. There's a modern day parable to that. And I actually had an experience of meeting on the border. And I think I read about this in the book and meeting in the meeting a family of, of a 30, I don't know, 35, 35 year old man, a 30 year old woman and a 10 year old boy. And I'm thinking this is a holy family. Uh, this Guatemalan family that was seeking to cross the border. And I kept thinking about, you know, Jesus and Mary and Joseph. So I think that's one part of the permissions that Ignatius it gives us permission in the exercises to use our imagination. And some people say, well, that's a, you know, that's fantastical. That's fancy. That's well, I mean, yeah, it all depends where your imagination goes. But if you're imag if you can, you're having permission to put yourself in the scene of a gospel, to create your own parable, to, to imagine you're there with Jesus in the boat right, or walking on the way to Calvary, that you're with Jesus, and you're in the scene of a gospel, and in that sense, and that's why for me it's been so helpful, the gospels just open up and speak to me in ways that are certainly up there in my head, but also in my heart, they're much more affective, they're much more, they connect to my spirit, to my heart, um, to my emotions, um, because I use that type of imaginative prayer, and I, I guess it's, it's exercise, it's, it's, it's really helped me strengthen that gift, of the imagination, which not only helps me to pray, but to, to lead and to govern and to, um, to, to, to write. Um, so I think imagination is, a we're, we're, God, God can use our minds, God, and part of that is our, the tools of imagination that God gives us. Very good. So we're going to have a question from the audience now, but it also will connect to, um, you know, I keep thinking about many people in our audience are probably saying 32 weeks of prayer, that is intimidating. And someone from the audience also asked, you know, when you were going through the exercises, did you have your own dark night of the soul? And can you relate to one of those moments? I mean, I'm thinking yeah. back to mine and yeah, just no, talk about that because I know a lot of people want to do the exercises, but it's intimidating and it's yeah. You know, well, and yeah, and so when we say do the exercises, there's so many different ways of doing the exercises. And again, remember adaptation and flexibility. Ignatius provided that. Some people, you know, if you were to do the whole course of the exercises, it would take a month full, full time, as a lot, a lot of all Jesuits do twice in their life. But you can also do it in the course of daily life over, you know, 32 weeks or so, more or less. I know Scranton offers that opportunity. But then you can also take them in different chunks. I mean, the weekend retreats that are at Scranton are, are sort of based on some of the key movements of the exercises. You can do days of prayer during Lent or Advent. I mean, they're all based on the tools and the themes of the exercises. So there's lots of ways of doing the exercises. Um, but certainly in the course of, if you were to make them in their completeness over the course of uh, you know, a month, or in the course of your daily life over eight months. Of course, like in any spiritual journey, there'll be ups and downs. And it, what's great is Ignatius offers you counsel but in both ups and downs. Um, you know, and in those moments of, of desolation, he would say, or distance or dryness, or maybe the dark night, if you want to call it that, of, of, of absence or separation um, from God or steaming absence or separation from God you know, Ignatius counsels you to be gentle with yourself, to be careful, to use your memory, to remember God's closeness. Um, the, sometimes the grace we're given is perseverance and courage in those times. So I guess what I just want to say is those ups and downs are a part of any human life, just like in any relationship that we have with a spouse or child or friend. They're good. I mean, there's some, some good days and bad days. And frankly, most are just sort of right in the middle, sort of that very ordinary peace and joy that comes with human living. I can say that you know the dark night just in in any in any life um, we all experience those moments of of again that sort of pretty severe aridity in prayer or distance from God or other people and I've certainly have I've had those moments in my spiritual life and I think of you know times in the course of um, of the last year where there are real moments of despair because everything seems so overwhelming about what was happening in the world and. And certainly, you know, there are some weeks there where I, I, it was a real struggle for me and looking for hope, looking for peace, wondering why it, it wasn't as easy for me to find it 
self doubts that would creep up and then just take hold. And that, that of course goes into a spiral of, of despair. So, oh yes, I know certainly in the last year I've had those, those, those times, but again, I go back to the, one of the directions in the exercises in those moments, remember times of God's goodness to you. Remember those times of God's goodness. Um, they also say, reach out to a, a spiritual director. I would say, reach out to someone who knows you well to offer that encouragement because the, our God wants to encourage us. Our God, of course, challenge at times, but our God wants to be an encouraging God. Uh, what, what Ignatius described the risen Lord in the exercises is one who brings consolation. That is one who brings encouragement, not answers, but encouragement that comes with, I think, faithful presence. Beautiful, beautiful. I have another question from an audience member. Uh, as you mentioned Francis quote about a God of surprises. How do the exercises continue to surprise you? Mm. That's a great question. I, um, yeah, I, I think how they continue to unfold in my life. And as I get older, it, it's simple. What I'm remembering is the simple, what I'm being given is this, often the simple truths are the ones we more easily forget because we are so sophisticated. We like, um, as academics, right, or as universities, sophisticated answers, or I don't know. I, I just, I, what I'm reminded, just like I shared with you earlier about how I'm experiencing in these months of the pandemic, this reminder to me of like, it's okay, I'm with you, I'm in the boat. I mean, that's really simple, but not in a, not in saying sim, simplistic, simplistically, right? Um, or silly, but simple truths can be, can be profound truths, can't they? So I think that's what I get surprised about. It, in a sense, it, you know, the exercises, the more we practice them and you know, the daily exam is a way of, is, is a spiritual exercise. And that's a wonderful thing that I'm sure you, you've learned about at Scranton um, that you know, it's all about depth. It's like this downward spiral. And my life is not linear. I am like all over the board. And then I'm learning to think, actually, it's more like this. I'm sort of, sort of going around into the same things, but going deeper and deeper and deeper. And the deeper I get, the simpler I get. And in the end is that, you know, the great theologian, Karl Rahner, my favorite, said in the end, and he was one of the greatest theologians who wrote all these um, you know, very big books with long, long, long sentences <laughs> in very difficult to read German with brilliant insight. But in the end, he said, you know, all theology ends in silence or all theology ends on its knees. Because in the end, you get, you sort of kneel before this mystery of who God is. And like when you're in the presence of someone you love, sometimes you're just in this awesome silence. So silence, that's right. So you think about, you know, your role as a spiritual director, uh, you know, more than a counselor, you know, but a lot of times those spiritual directors, they're not talking. Can you talk a little bit about how that spiritual director just nudges you through life or nudges you through the exercises? Right. And, and uh, so if you have a spiritual director, you can ask for one. I'm sure it's Granton, Pat Rogers can help you find one, or there might be sort of groups of people helping one another. Mm -hmm. The point of a spiritual director or companion is, is not to give you answers. Uh, it's to really to be sort of a gentle pointer to offer advice. Ignatius was very clear about the spiritual director. You are not to get in the way of the primary relationship between the person and God. So, you know, to offer encouragement when needed, to offer challenge when needed, to sort of gently direct, gently sort of, you know, maybe push a little gently. But it, for me, it's about gentleness. And it's really, it certainly is about more listening than talking. And as a spiritual director, if I find myself talking a lot, I find myself, whoa, I'm getting in the way, or um, this is not about the person. And so for, a good spiritual director must listen attentively, sort of, in a sense, modeling for the person how attentively God listens to each of us. You know, I don't necessarily need a God of answers. Sometimes that would be great, but I just need a God who listens, who's present. And so in the end, whether a spiritual companion or friend 
so much of it is about not some brilliant advice or answer, but about that faithful, faithful presence, which models God's faithful presence to each of us. Thank you. We have time for one more question from the audience. Uh, yeah. It says, what is a good Ignatian practice for Lent? Ah, <laughs> great. An Ignatian practice for Lent. Well, I, I mean, I would say if you don't practice, if you're not in the custom of the daily practice of the examine, I think that would be a great daily practice, right? It's that 10 or 15 minute a day prayer, uh, this sort of grateful reviewing of the day. Uh, there are lots of resources, different ways of doing that examination. It's basically, it's a reflective, a grateful reflection on the day. And it's also helping you build the tools of discernment by being very attentive to, again, your experience both outside and inside of you, and to consider the choices you made in the course of a day, not to beat yourself up for like, oh, what a bad choice, but really it's about grateful, it's about grateful remembering. So I think that's a really great and practical practice. Um, and I would say, you know, look at your life and say, okay, is there an area in my life where I seek freedom? Now, and again, the, the typical candy chocolate thing. I mean, if that's something where you realize I, I'm, I have a, I'm addicted to chocolate or candy, it would be good to like, oh, that's fine. But I think there's like other things. Maybe you could be a little more creative or imaginative, just sort of when you pray, ask God, so God, where do I need to be more free? And so it could be like, I need to be free of fear. Like you may say, like, I'm, I find myself I'm fearful. I'm afraid of making a mistake. <clears throat> Afraid of putting myself out there. So it could be, well, actually, I'm going to practice not being afraid of that and practice putting myself out, out there. If I find myself, I'm too hard on myself. It could be being really very intentionally more gentle with yourself. Um, you know, if, if, if I find myself, relationships are disruptive because I'm overly critical. That, that's an unfreedom. That's usually an ego thing there. So I would say, like, look at your life and say, where do I need greater freedom in my life? And maybe just try that. And again, just sort of practice, go, go against that tendency that you think is unfree as, as your path to freedom or authenticity. Well, Father O'Brien, I have to tell you, we're very grateful, you know, and that's part of who we are in gratitude. We just want to tell you, thank you so much for being part of the Humanities in Action series, being part of, um, uh, the Gail and Francis Slattery Center for Ignatian Humanities. You opened our hearts to understanding the spiritual exercises for the lay person. And I just wanna tell you that um, I'm just so grateful. I know Rose is, uh, Greg, Father Pilar's, our new uh, soon to be president elect, I mean, our president elect that we heard today, but just thank you. Um, we have to remember that we, we have Father Pat Rogers, we have the Jesuit Center, we can go to scranton.edu to find more about the spiritual exercises and so many resources for our faculty, our staff, our students and our alumni. But your key words tonight that we wanna to take home, to use our imagination, to be flexible, adaptable and practice and God is love. And, would you like to say any closing remarks before we head off for the evening? No, just uh, just thank you. It's really wonderful to be at a great university. I'm just uh, really grateful to be with you all. Um, it's been good for my own spirit. When I do my exam later today, I'll look upon this time with really, really great gratitude. So the exercises are for all of us. And I think it's they're a gift to the church. And I think they're, they, they were a source of renewal for the church in Ignatius's time, and I believe very much so they're a source of renewal for us today, both the ah. church and maybe even a college campus. So right. thank you. Thanks thank for you. We the will course. just do a lot of discerning. So thank you so much Amen. and have a good thank evening. You. All right. Thanks, everyone. All right. Bye, everyone. Thank Bye. you. <laughs>